Data engineering. It sounds a lot like data science, but data engineering and data science occupy very different parts of the same process. Today we'll be talking to Joe Reese and Matt Housley, authors of Fundamentals of Data Engineering, a great book for people looking to get introduced to the field of data engineering in both a gentle and in-depth manner. We'll be talking about the history of data engineering such that we can understand where the industry is going in the future, what a data engineer is, and what are the tools and skills that data engineers have, including hard skills and soft skills. Here's Matt and Joe, authors of the Fundamentals of Data Engineering, uh, published by O'Reilly. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much for showing up on my channel. Thank oh, you. Oh, this is awesome. Thanks for interviewing us. Yes. It should be fun. Yeah. So, I mean, it's super exciting. Um, as some of my viewers may know, and you know, you guys may know as well, I started off as a senior data, or well, my previous job was I was a senior data analyst, and I recently moved into data engineering, uh, both for you know personal reasons and for like just a new challenge, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like from the IC perspective of a data analyst, I learned about 80% of the value there was to learn. Like obviously there's an infinite number of things to learn, but I, I think in, a, in many careers, you can learn about 80% of the value giving stuff within a certain number of years, quite honestly. Um, and I feel like I'd reached that with data analysis, so I decided to move into engineering. That's cool. But my question to you guys is, what is a data engineer in your words? Um, it, it depends on how deep you want to go. I, I think we have a whole chapter basically defining what data engineering is. But fundamentally, it's that you start with raw data ingredients and you make them useful. That's in a nutshell what data engineering is about. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, maybe the other big differentiator is that data scientists do this all the time, but they're doing it at kind of small scale on a single laptop. And with data engineering, the idea is to automate as much as possible, get those data flows automated, make them happen at scale so that other people can consume that data without thinking about all those pipeline well, steps. And I think they also, th there's the old trope that data scientists spend 80% of their yes. time getting, cleaning, processing data. In, in a perfect world, the data engineer would really be doing that type of work for the data scientists, so the data scientists or analysts can do what they were trained to do, which was modeling data, analyzing it, and so forth, so. Okay. Yeah. So it seems kind of like if you were to draw out a, um, kind of the life cycle of data. Yeah. Uh, the first person would be the data engineer touching the data. And then after that, it can branch out to an analyst or a data scientist after it's been prepped for them to go in, like, the most idealized organizations. Yep. Yeah, and even before data engineers touch it. So the, to be honest, there are multiple types of data engineers, and we're mostly focused on, like, data engineering to feed analytics or data science and other downstream processes. Before we get to it, you have generation. And so generation can happen in an application. It can happen in a SaaS platform. And then the data engineers, you know, bring it into their systems and start doing things with it. Yep. And in the context of what you're talking about, generation is basically, you know, you have uh, umpteenth data sources. So, yeah, you know, yep. you have uh, your ERP system, so uh, enterprise resource uh, yep. planning. Um, you have, you know, CRMs, uh, cons uh, customer resource management, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe external APIs and stuff like that. Say, yeah. you know, you run a sports team. Uh, you know, all the data you get from the NFL, all the yeah. data you get from external play, uh, platforms. Yeah. And basically, there are people managing those at kind of the source Correct. level. Yeah. And then getting that all in and, and ready for the analysts and scientists is the job of the data engineer. Exactly. You know, or, or also, um, you know, data scientists, analysts, but also other applications, like maybe a, re a reverse ETL process okay. or, um, or something related to that. So. Or increasingly like what we call embedded analytics, which means it's customer facing. So right. say I have a SaaS platform, you know, a new startup, and I want them to be able to do analytics on, say it's uh, an employee, you know, management platform. Yep. That would be an embedded analytics application. And so behind the scenes, there are data engineers working on that SaaS platform to make sure that they can do the analytics that they need to do. Right. So one question I have is, uh, let's say I'm running a, a, an application of some kind, like an iPhone mm -hmm. app. I'm creating that, right? Um, and let's say it is a uh, maybe like an app that shows the scores for various sports, mm -hmm. um, you know, just aggregated in one, one place. Basically, I'm recreating ESPN. Uh, I have a back-end data provider who gives me all that data, and I'm kind of just providing a front-end for it. Uh, is a data engineer going to be the one that's actually piping that data in for the software engineers, or is that a different flow? Are data engineers just interacting with scientists and the analysts for the most part? I think it depends on the company you work at and the, I think the division of the responsibilities and titles. It, it could very well be a data engineer that's actually working on those um, those systems, especially if you're talking large-scale event streaming yes. systems, for example, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, in other companies, it might be the software engineer doing this. I mean, we've seen all the above. And so, and we do have this notion of the data engineering life cycle, which we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah. But, but the other part of the life cycle, which we 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 do call out as well, is it's it, it can it can meander and uh, you know can wind back on itself and might might actually be um, you know out of sequence, so to speak, too. And so it, it just depends on the and where you are. Yeah. And the other thing I'll add is that quite often when a startup starts and it's you know four people maybe creating this sports analytics app. 
it is software developers doing this. And then all the time we get called in as consultants because people are hitting scaling issues. And that's where you maybe need to hire a data engineer to handle that large scale analytics that you're doing for your customers. Mm -hmm. So the way you're describing it, it kind of sounds to me that like the data engineering role uh, exploded out of the, or it came out of the need to handle large amount, like just massive amounts of data being shifted through organizations. Uh, would you guys be able to kind of take me through the history of the role existing? Because unlike, for example, a software engineer, yeah. as far as I can tell, a data engineering role is a, kind of a new century thing, uh, where software engineering has existed since the beginning of computers, basically. Um, so w what would you kind of say is like the beginning of the data engineer and like how do we end up here? I mean, I, I could make an argument that the data engineers existed since the database came out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and especially, you know, that the, I think the evolutions of databases in the 60s and 70s was really, um, I think you started seeing the establishment of practices mm -hmm. yeah. um, with data in general, uh, being able to query it and, and move it and so forth. Um, I, even MPP databases, I mean, those came out, you know, those in are the pretty 1980s, old. In the 1980s, yeah. Like, or 79, like, so I think it was the 70s, yeah. way back. Yeah. But, but the, I, you know, but, so data engineering, as we define it, has existed in some form, actually, for quite a while, but definitely before, um, you know, the 2000s, maybe it was a, uh, you know, in the 90s, it might have been an ETL or a BI developer mm -hmm. or, or some, or data warehouse engineer or something like that. But I mean, I mean, the data warehouse, I mean, that came out, what, 1989, right? Right. But I mean, there have been other, um, I would say, uh, you know, that, that was more of an attempt to, uh, you know, make, I guess, give, give a better way of, of querying data. Because before people were just querying production systems, and you know that, yeah. that, that right, had drawbacks. Right. So, so you know, it, it's 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 a, it's definitely an interesting uh, history. But I would say in the, the the term data engineer in the, in the modern parlance, I, I think that arose, um, you know, kind of in the maybe the early twenty tens. Um, I started seeing it maybe around like 2014, 2015. May have been, you know, but but you know, the, there was the uh, the big data era that, that spun out of uh, a lot of web scale companies in the, um, you know, the late 90s and 2000s, um, you know, that were just generating a ton of data. I mean, this is more data than um, was con could conceivably be handled by the types of uh, relational databases that, and, you know, other systems that had existed at that time. And so what it really meant is the, um, uh, um, you needed new approaches. And so a lot of these companies like Yahoo, Google, Amazon, developed internal systems because they were just, um, you know, hitting the wall with the traditional um, you know, types of systems that existed at the time. And what that meant, uh, you know, these are distributed systems, right? And what, I think what that meant is it, it forced people to, to kind of rethink, okay, so how are we handling data? What, is it, what does it mean to handle data at scale? Um, you know, in a lot of cases, these, this is data that just needed to be used in the application. So the, these companies, I think the line between, you know, uh, outcome and, and getting data with is, is, you know, it's very fuzzy, but it was a necessity they had to do this. And so, um, so yeah, and then you fast forward to today, I, I, I think Matt and I agree that data engineering is, um, the tooling has become a lot more abstracted and I would say um, more simple to use. But this also forces the engineer to, um, you know, the data engineer to maybe work on higher value type problems or higher order type problems, which is now, you're not necessarily worried about scaling systems as you are um, maybe you know, squeezing out more value of your, of your data and, and the use cases of it. So what do you... And what I might add, so you were mentioning big data is a big driver. And I think um, when Joe and I kind of got into the industry, that was like the standard, like it was still called a big data engineer. And when I, big data got easier to handle, and there, be, there was this shift toward big data was easier, but complexity was still hard. Mm -hmm. And so the modern data engineer, yes, they have to tune big data systems, but increasingly they're focused on managing complexity. And so for example, we frequently see clients where at a you know big size company, you have maybe hundreds of SaaS platforms that are used across that company, and you need to get data out of all of them, and you need to orchestrate all that data movement. Data right. flow. Mm -hmm. And that's what a data engineer does. So uh, what I'm kind of getting out of this yeah. is that a lot of the um, problems in relation to kind of like just the sheer scale of data yeah. are being solved or you know have been solved. And really what the issues are, are there's so many different sources of data. How yes. do you actually coordinate all of these together in yes. one consistent flow? That way your data scientists and your data analysts actually have a very, uh, well, I mean, an e as easy of a time as possible. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and it's a notion, uh, you know, increasingly you're, you're hearing the term data product as well um, and data applications. And it is, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, assembling all those, um, you know, pieces of data together into something that is coherent and that, that's essentially... Um, you know, a data product or some, some some sort of output like that. But yeah, the, the challenge really is there's just like a lot of uh, um, heterogeneity in the um, data sources right now. Right. But, I mean, 
we, we have one friend, uh, you know, Ethan Aaron, and his company Portable. I mean, they're, they're trying to focus on long tail data connectors. What I mean by that is like all the connectors that aren't the uh, 150 mainstream connectors that mm-hmm. everyone, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a tough problem to solve. Um, I mean, if you think about how many uh, uh, fintech companies or ad tech companies are out there that might have APIs that you can read from, I mean, that's. I, I don't even know if I can count right. that high. Yeah. So. And the thing I'll add is, like, we, we actually highly recommend that even seasoned data engineers use automated products. But it mm-hmm. actually only removes part of the complexity because once you're, you're sourcing data from, like, 100 different places, you have to figure out how to make sense of it. Like, what are the different keys? How do you merge across data yeah. sets and all those kinds of mm-hmm. things? Yeah. Okay. So do you think that as uh, the amount of data a comp- – uh, a, a I mean, sorry, the amount of data an organi- organization has scales or the number of sources they scale, mm-hmm. you need to hire more data engineers in a linear fashion? That's a good question. I, I think it depends on the, the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it depends on the complexity of the data sources. Um, you could potentially linearly scale up. You could also logarithmically scale up as well, and maybe you can do more with less over a, cer- okay. after a certain threshold. Yeah, so. and it partially depends on like you, it actually depends a lot on your machine learning and data science teams too, yep. and what kinds of specialized applications they have. Because you know, going back to that eighty percent rule, a lot of the job of data engineers to make those teams more productive. And so, if if a company is doing very specialized machine learning, they probably need more help from data engineering to do things like futurization, and right. the cleaning, and quality control. Or say that you have a bunch of different data sources and you need to make a a, a data model for analytics. Like mm-hmm. that's yeah. potentially a very time consuming and high effort um, thing. And so, I think it just depends on what what are you trying to do with the data. At the end of the day, I mean, you're gathering all this data, um, but that's not the same thing as using all this data, yeah. right? So too often, I mean, that, that notion really came from, I think, the era of the, the days of big data, um, you know, in the, the early days of the data lake. We call it data lake 1.0, where those became more like data swamps in a lot of cases. It's like, around what time was this? This was around like kind of the late 2000s, early 2010s. Okay. Um, you know, I think uh, this is also before a lot of regulations where, mm-hmm. you know, you can just dump a lot of yeah. data into, you know, HDFS or, um, you know, object storage and just kind of set it and forget it. But you know, now, uh, now that there are regulations that might, um, you know, force you to do things differently, I, I think, uh, you know, people, people are governing the data in a um, you know, much more intelligent manner. Right. So, yeah. Well, I would say thoughtful manner. I don't know if it's intelligent, but it's... Uh, we hope that it becomes intelligent. I think yeah. this movement is still ongoing. I mean, talk, Joe talks about the pendulum swing, which means, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, enterprises were very interested in data governance. And then in the big data era, everyone's like, oh, you don't need to govern your data, just collect it, and it's fine. And now there's this realization like, hey, we need to govern it. How do we do that? Yep. And we're still figuring that out for the new era, I feel like. Right, okay, yeah. no, that no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna probably ask the, uh, I'm gonna mention it for the millionth time. There was an article that came out in like 2011, 2012. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. It's uh, data science, the sexy job of the 21st century. Yeah. How, how you claim something to be that like in the first <laughs> yeah. decade of the second decade of a century, I have no idea, but yeah. you know, like whatever. Um, we, we're still the, talking about it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I guess the question I have is, um, they did a rewrite, or not a rewrite, but they did a update on that article recently. And, you know, reading between the lines, at least, what I got out of it, and, you know, it might be my bias now being a data engineer. I like to yeah. think my position is very important. But um, the what, what I was kind of getting out of it was that there was kind of an over-indexing of what a data scientist could accomplish without mm-hmm. data being, like, you know, clean, ready, available. Yeah. Um, do you think that for the next decade or so, probably the growth of the data engineering, uh, like the number of job recs, is going to be higher than most other data professions? I think so. I mean, one, so some of our friends have said, you know, when I hire a data scientist, I probably need three data engineers to support them. I think you've used a different ratio sometimes. Well, I, I flipped it actually. It was yeah. five, the, the research I had done was about five to one, but I think it depends on your company. Depends on what yeah. you work and what it, it's always, it, it depends. Yeah. And so, sure. you know, that, that article, I mean, I, I had been doing data science yes. long before that term came out. And yeah. so um, it was a bit shocking when I saw that article because it's like, I, I suppose this could be an interesting job. I don't think it'll be the sexiest job of the 21st century. But, you know, what, what that article did, though, and what I'm glad that it accomplished is it got a lot of people interested in the field. Mm-hmm. And so data back in the day when I got into it, back in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, it was like, um, you know, if you watch Office Space... Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the, um, who's the actor name? But I, I remember the movie. Yeah, you remember that guy with the red stapler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was stuck in the basement. Like, that's kind of what data people were back then. Uh-huh. Like, data was not a cool thing. Right, like, you were, right. like, basically one step up from, like, that guy, or you were that 
guy actually. Um, <laughs> so you know, you didn't. I mean, so it was just a, it was a different world back then. Um, you know, what I what I think is pretty cool is data suddenly became this, um, you know, a really cool thing to do all of a sudden. I mean, it was a bit weird for me because I'm like, yeah, I mean. I don't know. Is it cool? Like, mm -hmm. so it's uh, you know, but but it is, and you know, I'm, it, it's kind of cool that we're all hanging out here now because we're, we're data peeps, right? Yeah. And so, um, but what you know, what I think happened too, because this is why Matt and I call ourselves recovering data scientists, is um, I had seen a lot of, and I, I grew, I grew really cynical about data science like super early. I think like very, when the article came out, oh, I was just okay. kind of like, oh. Uh, I would have expected it would be like 2017 or something, but that's early, yeah. Well, because what I realized, you know, except I was working at a machine learning startup mm -hmm. um, at the time. We were doing auto automated ML back in back in the day. And what I realized, like, a lot of the problems uh, had to do with engineering, um, the pipelines and the systems to do machine learning in an automated fashion at scale. And, like, that was, to me, the hardest part. The algorithms part was, like, not that, I mean, it's hard, but it's not as hard as, like, right. making the systems to do it. And so that was interesting. Um and then I kept seeing a lot of data scientists getting into these jobs, mm -hmm. doing data science, and they weren't really productive because they didn't have the data. Um, I think that along with the rise of you know data science being the sexiest job was also um, a lot of uh, FOMO, fear of missing out with companies where it's like, oh, well, we've got to be doing data science because if we're not doing that, obviously we're going to get passed up. So it created like an interesting prisoner's dilemma um, of like you, your optimum strategy is to hire a data scientist because the lack of doing that would mean... You, know, you could get passed up, and so you saw this. Um, you know, a lot of interest in data science. But when I, so when I would look between, you know, kind of read between the lines and see what people were actually accomplishing in these jobs, it was the success rate was pretty low, to be frank. So uh, you're saying kind of like uh, the, the the motto of the data engineer could be uh, making data science fun again. In some sense, yeah, it's like data scientists really should be able to focus on hacking on data, yeah. right? But. I mean, you understand this. Maybe we'll loop back to this in a second. You you won the challenge today, <laughs> which a lot of that was about like data. Yeah, the iron analyst. Iron analyst. Yeah. 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 Ninety percent of my time was just like like cleaning the data. You're exactly. Right, you know? And yeah. like, having better tools. Right. The, the feature data, engineering, all kinds of stuff. Feature engineering you know? makes your life easier. Yeah. Which yeah. a decent amount of it could have been done by a data engineer, honestly. Exactly. Um, and, and so these are some of the observations, and I yeah. do think like data engineering is going to. Um, I mean, I think it's already getting recognized as as a, as a complementary. Um, sexy job, yeah. you know, so, um, and, and it's helping data scientists become more successful. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it, you know, it's a good pairing. Um, and whatever the ratios are, is, you know, whatever that is, I don't know, but, um, you know, data scientists, data engineers, but I do think that, you know, we can, we can definitely all win together. Right. So, you know, a data, the data engineer is sort of useless without somebody to take advantage of the data that they've been right, producing. Right, exactly, and, a, exactly. and a data scientist, this is what we saw too often was, um, uh, data scientists would just be expected to do everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt, walk through your experience getting hired as a data scientist. Oh, no, no, no. So it just told me, yeah, it, I got hired by someone at the top of the company. The company was having some problems, and so they, they hired a friend of mine to build the data science team, and then he hired me because we knew each other from working on math papers and such. But, but, but what, t maybe tell the audience about, you know, you, you're, a, you're a math PhD. Right? I'm a math so PhD. You're like yeah. the yeah. archetype of like <laughs> yeah, yeah. the person who is, the, oh, he's a math PhD, so obviously he can work magical things. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the attitude was like, all right, I hired you guys, so what magic do you have for me? And we're like, um, so how does this company work, first of all? Why don't we talk through that? And what, what are we trying to accomplish? Like, what do we think we can do with data? Let's identify some things first. And then going back to the discussion of like having this opposite problem, data engineers that where the data isn't really getting consumed, we had that. Like, we had a big data team, and the whole Hadoop system was so slow that no one really used it. it we couldn't query it. It was Hadoop. So there's, like, this big disconnect between the interesting data and the really exciting stuff we were supposed to be doing. And so that's how I became a recovering data scientist. Like, I just started getting involved in building infrastructure and building cloud systems yep. and finding ways to actually provide data for interesting applications. And so eventually, I think we did have an impact, but it's not like we could snap our fingers and work magic. Like, right. it's not, yeah, yeah, there's no, like, you can't wave a magic wand and suddenly have results. And I think having done analytics, you completely understand this. Like, yeah, you gotta, mm -hmm. what's the problem we're trying to, like, what our, what's our business goal? Let's start Exactly. There. Yeah. And I mean, it's also kind of like, you're right, like, yeah. analysis and data, like, many large parts of data cleaning are, like, such different, they use such different, like, yeah. parts yeah. of the mind, you know? Uh, and so, like, that, that context switching, if someone could, like, you know, do a good chunk of that for me, mm -hmm. uh, or, like, remove barriers, like, oh, I need to query, like, you know, 50 gigabytes of data, but yeah. I can't get anything out of this bucket, you know, like, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, stuff like that, I, I would, 
argue you're right. Like a data engineer makes a data scientist or data analyst actually effective yep. and not just like, you know, stuck in a server all day trying to figure out how to like, you know, get data to do really basic things. When I was talking with, with Josh Starmer about this last night. It was kind of funny because he's like, yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, if, you, if you're in a band, like you're going to play an instrument, you're not going to play, you know, you're not going to be a one man band. Right. right. But that's, that's kind of how I think data science was viewed for a long yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Just like these magical, I've heard the well, term unicorn used to reference data well, science. If you look at these, they have these, like, I saw these skill <laughs> yeah. set charts listing out, what, what does a data scientist need to know? And it's like, uh, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was everything. Yeah. And, and a lot of it, yeah. I mean, so if you if you were looking at entering the field, you're like, um, I don't even know where to start on this. This is too intimidating. Yeah. You know, so. So you bring up skill set, uh, skill set char- charts, right? Um, you know, now obviously, like with any of these professions, uh, depending on the company you're in, depending on the tech stack, the skills will change. Yeah. Uh, but for example, I like to tell people that are, you know, becoming data analysts or data scientists, uh, I like to tell them, okay, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, um, learn SQL, yep. learn a BI tool of some kind, and then learn Python or R. I personally recommend Python, but, you know, technically either would work. Um, what would you say are kind of skills that are very transferable across many different data engineering roles? Uh, and let's start with the hard skills and then yeah. go to the soft skills. I think the hard skills are actually not technology focused. And I think all too often the, the answer to a, a skill is, oh, it needs to be technology X, Y, or Z, right? But I think it's actually, it, it's, it goes deeper than that. The way you need to think about this is, um, how am I effective with the business, right? So that's communication skills. That's actually knowing how to ask questions and um, you know, communicate with stakeholders. That's by far the hardest skill, actually. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how many really good engineers I know who sh- they stunt their growth professionally because they can't talk to people or they don't want to. And right. so they're, you know. Um, so that's a hard one. I think stepping it back and understanding the context of the system that you're um, working in or going to build and being able to architect and think through uh, maybe macro type problems and how things interrelate, like that's another hard skill. I think all too often engineers, they want to engineer stuff. So they focus on, I'm just going to use this tool and you know that's gonna be engineering and i'm like that is engineering strictly in a sense but also it, it misses the bigger picture of what you're trying to do um those two are the hardest ones and then after that i would say it's it's once you have the context and understand the business problem it's much easier to know what tools you're going to use to, to accomplish your job a lot of people try and approach it from the inverted way or the opposite way which is oh let's pick our tools and then let's go find some problems mm-hmm. to solve i mean it's a classic hammer and nail situation right um but instead of nails, everything's a screw, and then right. you know, and it doesn't work. And so this is, um, you know, sort of the paradox again. It, it, the tool discussion. I, I never, I, I rarely talk about tools anymore. I mean, Matt knows this. It's like I always think, okay, it's so like what, what is the context in which you're trying to succeed, mm-hmm. right? So I, I guess uh, another way to ask the, the question then, right? So I, I think in the context of I've been hired as a data engineer, I'm at a new company, uh, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yep. Uh, say I'm a student though. Yep. Uh, I don't really have any real problems to solve. And mm-hmm. the only thing I, the only like reference I really have are videos like this and maybe job descriptions of which I, I debate the efficacy of job descriptions yeah. and actually like, you know, understanding great. what you need to know. What yeah. do you think are like maybe technologies people could like become familiar with? That's, that's a perfect way to frame it, because what I was going to say about your discussion of R versus Python, I probably I, I would generally choose Python, but learn either one, and then assume that when you get into the job, you're probably going to have to learn something right. else. Right. The idea is to get exposed to the general ideas and learn a technology, and then go in and figure out which particular technology. Well, I would take a step back, too, and understand, yeah. okay, so like how to, if you're getting started and you have nothing, no problem to solve, I would say... Um, I understand sort of the first principles yeah. too, like how does how does storage actually work, mm-hmm. right? How does uh, ingesting data and querying it? How do how do those things work? If you can get the first the fundamental first principles down, approaching any tool set is actually su- super easy. But the opposite isn't always true. Like if I know how mm-hmm. Python works, that doesn't necessarily mean I know how um, you know memory works or, or CPUs or disk works, right? But if you can understand, I think the basic principles, just like the the the, the primitives that you're using. I would say this actually sets you up to be a really good engineer in general because now you're just able to say, okay, so like, um, I think you guys had a problem today where you're trying to download a, a, a large file. There are efficient ways to do this. There are definitely inefficient ways to do this. Mm-hmm. And knowing yeah. how best to approach this is, um, you know, it could save you a ton of time and, and headache. And I'd say these are, that's how I would approach it. There's a, the cool thing is, like Matt always calls it the embarrassment of riches. There's, mm-hmm. there's so many great tools yeah. and technologies out there. It's almost overwhelming. Yes. And the problem is, there's, I think, Back to the skill sheets too. There's like I think there's a lot of BS when it comes to mm-hmm. saying, oh yeah, data engineers need to know Spark and Hadoop and all this stuff. And I'm like, 
I, I say throw those lists out the window. I mean, focus on first principles first. How do distributed systems work? So Martin Kleppman's book, um, Des Designing Data Intensive Applications, is a fantastic resource. Or book I, we consider it's a prequel. Yeah, yeah like we, it, it's a prequel to it. You know, uh, to de design data. But I think between this and, and Martin's book, um, you know, you, you have a good uh, context for things. Um, because here's the deal, tool, uh, tools are going to change, they always do, um, but you know, first principles don't necessarily change as quickly. Yeah. One, uh, so in that case, a question I have in re reference to that, right, so I, I see the logic of what you're saying. Would one way to go about it be, uh, you know, study the first principles, be like, okay, well, obviously data needs to move from this storage bucket to this storage bucket. Uh, how does that actually happen? How much data is it? Do you think that given the, I, I mean, what I honestly call the blessing of cloud computing, yep. um, it makes sense to do that and then kind of map those skills onto like AWS. For sure. Uh, yes, and be like, absolutely. Okay, well, storage, S3, <clears throat> cool. Yep. You know, streaming data, Kinesis, done. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, and storage too. The other thing I'd say with storage is um, use object storage, and, S3, and then also use like Elastic Block Store in an EC2 instance mm -hmm. and intentionally do it the hard way, like do it the manual way, spin yeah. up a server, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, Set, you know, attach a volume to it, you know, attach a, um, you know, machine image to it and just get to know the tools that you're using. How does, how does networking work? This is right. the thing. These yeah. are the things that screw up data engineers. I'd say more than anything else is like all the non data engineer stuff actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So networking, security, VPCs, networking. VPCs, yep, yep, like, yep, yep. but this is the kind of stuff. So if you take a, um, a certification exam in one of the clouds, this is the kind of stuff they ask you, right? Like mm -hmm. the important stuff, which is, okay, I need to set up a network. That's important. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause knowing how to use say like Redshift is great, except that in order to use Redshift, you have to understand, okay, so um, I am in a VPC, I have to access data somewhere else, I have a federated query, how does this work? How do I load data in? Um, I need permissions. Like mm -hmm. These are the other things I would say that are super underrated, which yeah. if you can learn these things, you're gonna be effective on a team because you're gonna move fast, right? Right. The last thing you wanna do is be sitting there like, huh, what is IAM? What does that stand for? Um, yep. You know, and this happens all the time. It does. Yeah. The problem is, even in a big company, often the data engineers being, end up being responsible for security. It's just a reality. Right, right. And you don't want to be the engineer at Capital One Bank, for example, who mm -hmm. misconfigures S3 permissions so that data gets stolen. Like, you don't want that happening. Y'all actually cite a lot of very interesting, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's like there are articles like S3 data leaks or something like that, like leaky buckets or something. Yeah. Of uh, just like, um, so for anyone not aware, an S3 yeah. bucket is, so S3 stands for super simple storage or something like that. Um, and basically it is just really cheap storage at AWS, Amazon Web Services. Yeah. Makes it available for you online. All the cloud providers have their own version of it. Yeah. Uh, and AWS launched in like, I think, O2 or something with like S3 and EC2, which is Elastic Cloud Compute, uh, which is basically like a computer in the cloud. Um, you combine those two things, you can do basically anything. But obviously the services have expanded greatly. To, for, you know, very it's like the Cheesecake Factory menu. Like there's so many, yeah. so many options in AWS. And, and stuff like 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 stuff does the same stuff that other stuff does, and it's like you know, for example, like you know, Athena and even Redshift Server was kind of like overlap each other sometimes. These things, yeah, these days. absolutely. And I would say you know one thing. So if you're new to the field too, one thing I would suggest is obviously get familiar with these clouds. They all have great free tier plans. Yeah. Um, as you get more experience, I, I would say study for a certification and take yeah, it okay. right. So the AWS Solutions Architect is a fantastic cert if you're an AWS. Um, their analytics uh, specialty is, um, I guess, the big data one. You know, ECP professional data engineer. Even yeah. if you're not, that's a great ECP, exam. It teaches you a lot of principles. The concept the basically transmit. They do. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the principles are about like, okay, at, when do I when, I, when am I processing stuff in large batches versus when am I doing quick updates? Uh, Understanding those differences are key to data. Well, and the other thing too, like you know, I've been using AWS for a long time, and I got my uh, yep. Solutions Architect uh, cert back in 2017, I think, and even. Even though I'd been using AWS, I don't think I understood how AWS wanted to be treated. Uh -huh. And this is like a hidden secret. Like every cloud and every technology has its way that it wants you to handle it. Um, it's like a pet or something, right? right? Um, and if you try and so, fight it, or if you don't understand the way it wants to be handled, um, you're gonna make some really crazy mistakes. Definitely. They call like the AWS Well Architected Framework or something. It, like yeah, that. WAF. Yeah, yeah. 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 Their exams are the guidebook, basically. Right. They publish their own exam guides. That basically tells you what their best practices are. You're gonna end up reading tons of blog posts and right. from their engineers. But yeah. if you get that context and just take the time to understand, yeah. okay, so how does AWS like? How do they want us to do stuff in AWS? You're gonna be super effective because right. the number of people that actually know how to use these cloud services and cloud platforms. It's there are a lot of certified people, and I think that's awesome. That signals like they're great. 
but the number of non-certified people is very high. But I also yeah. there's a stunning Kruger thing too. Where it's like, yeah. oh, I know AWS. I don't need to take a search. Search are stupid. Right. Well, like, and I, I mean, one yeah. point, one term I coined is cursed familiarity. So the cursed yeah. familiarity is that you go to the cloud and you're like, oh, this is an EC2 instance. It's just like Linux that I, you know, the server sitting in my basement. It's like, well, it kind of is, but it's now in a VPC and like there are a whole different right. set of best practices that you need to understand to use it correctly and not do things insecurely, for example. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we went through some great content over here. Um, do you guys have any final remarks you want to have before we close off? Um, just buy our book. <laughs> it, it is a great book. Um, so originally, I was reading Martin Sutman's book, um, Designing Data Intensive Applications. Amazing book. It went kind of over my head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, in, in a good way, though. Like, I, I could tell it wasn't BS. I could tell it was like, oh, this is like real stuff. I just don't understand it. Um, I started reading this one, and then this one goes over a lot of content that kind of, like, bridged those knowledge gaps that I had, uh, coming from analytics and going into engineering. I don't actually have a strong engineering, like, I don't have engineering fundamentals with me. So this is doing a lot to help me kind of, like, crash course my way into my job and help me learn stuff faster uh, before people find out I don't actually know what I'm talking about. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I have been reading, and I think it's a, an excellent introduction into the field. And that was our goal, too. I mean, because, uh, you know, uh, Martin's book, I still consider it to be, I think, one of the best books I've ever read. I think I've read it, like, three times now. Um, you know, and, and he, he, was a, he was one of our tech reviewers for the book, too. So, you know, it was good getting his feedback on, on things. And, um, and it really does feel like this is more, I would consider, the prequel to, yeah. to his book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, but definitely read his book. Uh, I think it, it definitely expands into, um, you know, some, some very deep waters and yeah. other great books too. I would say, uh, database internals on O'Reilly as well is a fantastic book that goes deep into everything you ever wanted to know about databases and how they work, which mm -hmm. I would suggest that people learn at some point. And, um, but the, you know, but the, uh, shameless self promotion aside, I would say, you know, the, the thing you really need to do is just, uh, you know, Keep learning every day, you know, try and get 1% better and, you know, that, that compounds over time. So, and don't be afraid to make mistakes because you will, but just don't make them publicly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I, I mean, yeah, this, these couple days of hanging out with the, the crew here, there's been a big emphasis on projects, which I think projects are fantastic. In other words, find opportunities to do yep. your own projects. The great thing about the cloud is that you can basically build on enterprise infrastructure. Right. Obviously, you don't want to build an enterprise scale. It gets very expensive. But do projects, you know, read Martin's book, hopefully read our book, yeah, build some actual systems, and some, learn data. And there's some great content, yeah. too. Um, you know, uh, Ben Rogajan and uh, Zach Wilson have some great data engineering content. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say, like, check their stuff out, too. Um, akiko has got a great, uh, just pointing people in this room here, <laughs> great, uh, <laughs> great ML Labs blog. So, you know, it, and the, the cool thing is, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of great content. I think there's more and more on data engineering. And, and the other thing I'd say is read the classics, too, you know, um, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, Ralph Kimball wrote some great books back in the day. Bill Inman, you know, he, um, uh, you know, kind of created this industry. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of great books out there. So, don't be afraid to, to read the classics either. You'll learn a lot. So, all right, yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you gentlemen. Um, great talk, and uh, thank you. We'll definitely stay in contact and see if you guys let me let me know if you guys uh, have any further questions for them. Comment in the comment section below, uh, and I can go ahead and make sure that they get those questions answered. Thank you guys so much for your time, and have a great day.